I've come to the conclusion, and it's actually a pretty, you know, it took me a long time to figure this out, but I think for most of you, it would, would seem obvious, is if there is such a thing as a best approach out of all of these approaches, the best approach I think would be one where one focuses on multi-baggers. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing some clips from one of Monish Pabrai's recent Q and A's, where he shared some really interesting points about the different styles of value investing and which one he thinks is best. I do apologize for the audio in this interview. For some reason, Monish's current microphone is a bit dodgy. So I'll put subtitles on screen for you guys. There's a lot to get through in this video, so let's get started. When we look at this large tent called value investing, it encapsulates quite a range of approaches and uh, focuses one could have while trying to create wealth and generate good returns and so on. So for example, buying a dollar that is uh, trading for 50 cents would be a great way to be a value investor, focusing on cannibals, which is companies that are buying back their stock, you know, looking at what I call spawners, which is businesses that are really good at creating new businesses and then you know spinning those off so that's that's another way one can go focusing on multi baggers is also well within the within the tent of value investing you know one could do special situation investing merger arbitrage it's it's a long list of endeavors and initiatives you know ben graham suggested net net investing and so on so there's many different approaches one can take which would all be within the tent of value investing you know, they say that you're old too soon and wise too late. And I've, I've, you know, made investments over the last quarter century or more, which have covered pretty much almost all of these. I've come to the conclusion, and it's actually a pretty, you know, it took me a long time to figure this out. But I think for most of you, it would, would seem obvious, is if there is such a thing as a best approach out of all of these approaches, the best approach, I think, would be one where one focuses on multi-baggers, you know, businesses that can be a 10x in 10 years or less, or maybe a 100x in 20 years or less. So out of all the different styles of value investing he mentioned, he thinks the best one is focusing on multi-baggers, businesses that can 10x in 10 years, or 100x in 20 years. And the reason he picked those numbers isn't random. This is something that was first pointed out to me on Phil Town's podcast, where he talks about 26 being the magic number in investing. Quite simply, if a stock is a 10 bagger in 10 years, then the compounded annual return is 26%. And if a stock is a 100 bagger in 20 years, the compounded annual return is also 26%. So 26% is the magic number we're chasing if we use the multi-bagger approach. So the multi-bagger approach the multi-bagger approach to investing has a few quirks and it requires us to kind of change our mindset on a few fronts. So one of the, one of the changes one has to make is that, you know, traditionally, traditionally when one looks at what Ben Graham, kind of the you know, father of value investing taught us, is that you buy something for well below what it's worth. And then as it approaches fair value, you sell the position and then you, you know, go look for something else. But in, a, in the multi-bagger framework, what you would do is you would actually not particularly care if a position became fully valued or even overvalued. So for example, if, if you bought, you know, a business for 30, 40 cents on the dollar. And it's growing, that dollar is growing. And at some point it's worth a dollar fifty, for example. It's gone up more than 50% over what it used to be worth. But the stock is trading at two dollars, for example. So under traditional Grammian approaches, you would sell that as you get past the dollar fifty or whatever. But in in the quest for multi-bagger you would continue to keep it in your portfolio even when it became overvalued. I think this is the most important point he mentions about the multi-bagger framework. In order to use this framework successfully, 
One must ignore the traditional value investing approach of buying below intrinsic value and then selling when it becomes fully valued or overvalued. You do want to buy at the best possible price and ideally well below intrinsic value. But the key is not selling the multibagger too early and interrupting the compounding process, especially if it's a quality compounder with a long runway. Charlie Munger says the number one rule of compounding is never interrupt it unnecessarily. So it's important to avoid selling a multibagger too early, even if it becomes overvalued. Let's look at some examples of businesses that, and you know, that might help explain kind of where this approach is coming from and how it might work and so on. So if you look at a business, let's say McDonald's, for example, I, I think they went public in the 1960s. It's been public for maybe almost 60 years since then. It's still growing. You know, the number of restaurants, revenues, profits, et cetera. I mean, it's gone through some ups and downs over the years, but it's, it's, it's grown and it's grown spectacularly. It's like a 10,000 plus bagger. But the interesting thing about something like McDonald's is that almost all the innovations they came up with there were a lot of copycats and uh, there were many businesses that came up that cloned or tried to clone what they were doing. And in general, fast food became a huge industry uh, with many players. But anyway, even with all of that competition, McDonald's was able to establish a brand. People knew before they went into a restaurant, any McDonald's, what to expect, the kind of standardization and, and uh, you know, consistency, the cleanliness, the consistency, and, and the nature of the service worked. So that particular moat has been going strong for 60 years. There aren't really any signs that say that the moat is eroding and may not do so well in the future. They couldn't do well. And it's a high, it's a very high return on equity business. If you picked up the annual report of Walmart, let's say in 1980, for example, a few years, seven, eight years after they went public, you would see that they've got very superior economics at the store level, that they generate high returns on equity. It's, it's a business that does well. And you would also see that it was embryonic in the sense that large portions of the United States at that time, 1980, still did not have a Walmart. So you could see that basically this business could actually, if you, if you just looked at it in, in North America, there was a lot of room to grow. And you know, we could look at other, other businesses like let's say the Coca-Cola company. You know, the Coca-Cola company was formed about 130 years ago. And that moat is still growing after 130 years. And again, the unit economics are extremely attractive because the Coca-Cola company typically doesn't do bottling. They sell the syrup. So again, it's, it's very similar to McDonald's in terms of, uh, in terms of economics. So basically there are, there are businesses, different kinds of businesses. You can look at a business like MasterCard or Visa or American Express, and they have similar attributes. So he gives many examples of high quality businesses that became huge multi-baggers over long periods, such as McDonald's, Walmart, Coca-Cola, Visa, and MasterCard. And if we look at all of these businesses he mentioned, they all share similar fundamental characteristics that make them long-term compounders. In the next clip, Mona shares what these fundamentals are. And he also mentions another super investor called Chuck Acree, who uses a multi-bagger framework called a three-legged stool. So the the three legs that we need, uh, you know, I think Chuck Akri called it the three-legged stool. The three legs that we need for these long multi-baggers is first of all, the core economics of the business should have very high returns on invested capital, ideally without the use of debt. The second is that we want very high integrity management. And we want insider ownership, you know, kind of alignment of interest. And the third is that we want a very long runway. So where we can see that this thing can go on for a very long time. 
So if one pursues these now, you know, the nature of capitalism is that everyone wants to own these kinds of businesses. Once these kind of moats and, you know, runways, et cetera, are well known, the businesses get priced to perfection. And they may not be available at a cheap price. But the interesting thing is that if the runways are really long and they actually end up being runways that go on for you know, several decades, then even an expensive looking price can end up being a great value investment. But, but I think that as value investors, you know, we have to also have a good dose of skepticism in, in how we approach these things. So we can't always assume that, you know, everything's going to go to the moon in terms of, terms of size and growth. And uh, the nature of capitalism is that there will be a lot of competition that will try to go up against those moats. And as long as you're willing to put in the work to sift through company after company, you know, with the framework that you're interested in. So in, in the case of the multi-bagger framework, there are just three things that matter. And then the fourth is the price, obviously. So if a business doesn't generate high returns on equity, you're done. You don't need to spend any time on that. If the business needs a lot of debt to grow and generate high returns on equity, you could also be done. You don't even need those. If management quality or ethics is a question, you're also done. You don't need those either. And so just, just if you look at the businesses that generate high returns in equity, that alone would wipe out large swaths of businesses. There's a lot to take in there, so I'll break it down into two parts. The first leg is that the core business must generate high returns on invested capital, preferably without using a lot of debt. He changed it to return on equity later, but it doesn't make that much difference because essentially, invested capital is just debt plus equity. So if you're not using any debt, then return on invested capital and return on equity will be the exact same thing. The second leg is the business must have very high quality management who act with integrity, preferably with a high amount of insider ownership so there's an alignment of interests with the management team and the shareholders. And the final leg of this framework is the business should have a very long runway where it's clear to us that this business can keep growing for a very long time. If a business doesn't meet all of these requirements, then you can immediately be done with that business. And the second part of what he said is around valuation. He said only three things really matter, with the price being the fourth. And when moats and runways become well known, the businesses get priced to perfection, and they may not be available for a cheap price. But he also says that when a business has a really long runway, and it does end up growing for decades like a McDonald's or a Coca-Cola, then even an expensive looking price can still end up being a great value investment. In saying that, as value investors, we need to have a healthy dose of skepticism and understand that not everything will go to the moon. So overall, I found his take on multibaggers really interesting. I'm also looking for those multibaggers and I'm aiming for that magic number of 26% a year for all my investments. I seen Monish in another interview recently taking investment pitches from university students. And the first question he asked all of them was, can the business be a 10 bagger in 10 years? or a hundred bagger in 20 years. If they said no, he moved on to the next one. And if they said yes, he asked them to explain why. I thought it was really interesting. So I started doing it myself for any businesses I'm looking at, a sort of an initial screen. If the answer is no, and it doesn't have the potential to hit that 26% a year target, then I just move on straight away. And it's a good way to sift through dozens of businesses really quickly. Anyway, that's Monish Rabrai's take on the best style of value investing. And I hope you found it interesting. If you've watched the video all the way to the end, thank you so much for watching. And if you're still bored, I'll put another video up in the corner that I think you'll find interesting. And as always, this video is not financial advice and I'm not a financial advisor. So please always do your own research before making any investment decisions. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.